this works. Uh, as, as, I, as I said in the email, and thank you for all for coming along. Um, we nor, ordinarily, when we're doing it live in the venue, because there's there's opportunity to buy cocktails and and um, so forth, we would not ordinarily go, go for a couple of hours. But we found last time that after an hour we'd kind of had enough. So we'll we'll budget for an hour and see how we go from there. Um, the way this normally works is uh, an open open mic kind of thing, but. Fiona's here now, so uh, as the guest of honour, Fiona, would you like to introduce yourself? And and did you, you emailed me and said, what would you like me to talk about? And I said, I gave you a very evasive answer, didn't I? Mm. <laughs> um, so, yeah. you know, it's really up to you, because for those who don't know Fiona, Fiona, you're a, uh, you're a poet, you're a non-fiction writer, you're a memoirist, you're an essayist, you're a critic, you're a lifetime student like the rest of us. <laughs> um, commiserations on not quite, quite getting over the line with the prime minister with the premier's award. Uh, that's um, fine. It was a long shot. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was one in six. It's not that long a shot. But well, uh, look, I was saying to everybody beforehand that um, the big state prizes tend to go to either to go, tend to go to biographies of politicians or Anzacs or sheep farmers or sheep farmers who became politicians after serving as Anzacs. Um, and it went to a it went to a politician's biography. So, so like, Barbara Joyce is a shoe in for next time, then, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> the, um, yeah, I remember when I was on the panel there a few years ago, and the uh, the one that won nonfiction book of the year and also won um, the overall book of the year was uh, it was the Malcolm Fraser Fraser autobiography or slash auto slash biography with Mar Margot. Margaret Simons, Mike, Margaret Simons. Oh yeah, and um, I remember all the all the people who were the the, ch the judges for that section. They were all going. We came to this ready to absolutely hate it because yep. you know back in the seventies we were marching against Malcolm Fraser and all that he stood for. And then when they got, came to read it, they were like, "This is astonishing." And I don't know if anyone here's read it, but it, it really is a it's a pretty I'd amazing say, book. Yeah. I'd say that would be Margaret Simons' work. She's a fantastic fantastic writer but he came across as being you know as, as we all know he went from being the rogue to kind of almost a darling of the left by the end where he basically you know what a world push, yeah moved right <laughs> out of the whole big l liberal party and become a little l liberal um anyway so commiserations but you're okay. here and that which book was that for Remind that was for the world was whole so that was the my yeah, so that's my new collection of essays, which is, I think it was the end of 2018 that that was published. Um, but yeah, I think it was October 2018. So it feels old now. So what did you want to, um, what did you want to talk to us about tonight, Fiona? We've well, got the opportunity for people to ask questions. And if we, do you want to put your hand up if you have a question as we go, then I'm sure Fiona will be happy to stop and clarify or chat yeah. or, or whatever. I, I sort of... Oh, I've, I'm feeling a bit um, sort of um, in two minds about this now. I, I've, got a, I've got a thing that I like to read that is kind of a um, personal writing manifesto, um, <laughs> for want of a better term. Um, it's a bit, it's quite formal. Um, so I'm not sure if that's kind of the thing you're after. Um, otherwise, I'd be happy to just sort of chat um, if we start on... logging off in on mass, then you'll know that you've gone too far. So, what you do is have a run at it and see where we end up. Yep, that sounds good to me. Um, so this is this thing I, I sort of I wrote a little while back, um, sort of in in between my two books of essays, I suppose, um, and I think. Oh, duh. So I'll stop giving apologies. I'll just launch straight into it. <laughs> I'm trying to train myself out of that habit, but it takes a really long time. The, but, I always find that the good writers are the ones that continue to apologise. <laughs> once you kind of become too confident and stop apologising, it probably means that you kind of lost yeah. perspective a little bit, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, off you go. All right. Um, so I call this piece The Magnetic Signature of Empathy, which is kind of a bit pompous, but it'll become obvious why a little way in. Um, and I start by talking about a friend I have who is a PhD in bioinformatics and statistics and who loves to make lists as Facebook updates. 
lists with titles like things that are overrated, things that are more annoying than you think. And recently, my friend posted a list called Things You All Need to Stop Saying, which started with a few bits of nice internet speak, like just saying, you all have to stop just saying because it's never really just saying, it's always actually making a point. Uh, and literally, when you literally mean it's exact opposite. But the final point on the list was the personal is political. You all need to stop saying that the personal is political, my friend wrote, because it's just not. Now, you might have guessed this already, but my friend is a man. He's a white man, and he's a straight, white, cisgendered, middle-class man in the full bloom of health, with a full-time job, even now, and a family home that he could always return to should anything go terribly wrong. And I've tried to pull him up on this, to invite him to check his privilege, as it were, although I'm sure he'd add that phrase to his list of things that you all need to stop saying. And I've tried to suggest that maybe his personal doesn't seem political because he won the identity lottery, but he won't have a bar of it. And short of giving him a crash course in feminist politics and gender studies that he'd probably just dismiss anyway, I've never, feel, I've never really figured out how to contest this point with him. Because, and I think it's because the main reason that I know the personal is political <coughs> is because I've lived it. Um, because I've felt it in my very body. And even I'm still uncomfortable with, with knowledge that's intuited like this. Um, and like any self-respecting scientist, especially a bioinformatician and a statistician, my friend works purely with quantitative data in all of its rational and measurable majesty, which means he's got very little time for qualitative data and its subjective accounting for emotion, sensation and pain, even less time still for intuition. Now, I trained as a journalist um, back in the day before, and I kind of now think of that as a bullet dodged. And I did it because you know, you've got to have a real job to fall back on and we're always going to need journalists. Um, <laughs> it's the early noughties, what do you do? Um, but there's still a journalist who lives inside of me and I'm always tempted as retaliation to rattle off a list of quantitative stuff to say things like, until only a few years ago, there were only four public hospital beds in the entirety of New South Wales for adult eating disorder patients. And that these were and still are in the general psychiatric ward of RPA and that they're only available for people who are so underweight that they're medically imperiled. And the waiting list at the time that I was on it was 48 weeks long. Um, or the fact that I used to spend more money each week on my health care than on my rent, even here in Sydney, at a time when the government kept trying to introduce co-payments for GP visits, or the fact that I've calculated I've spent more than $70,000 on treatment over the eight years that I've pursued it, and I only stopped because I never, I, because I realised or kind of finally accepted that I'd never, I'd always be unwell. Or the fact that my condition affects almost 2 million people in Australia, and has the highest mortality rate of all mental illnesses. But all of this is very much beside the point. I like to think instead of recent scientific research into mirror neurons, which are a particular kind of cell within the brain that are largely responsible for learning, but also for empathy. So mirror neurons become active when we watch someone else do something and they trigger the same areas of our brain that would light up if we were actually doing that thing ourselves. So when we watch someone dancing, that is, the part of our brain that responds when we dance is pushed into action by our mirror neurons. Or when we see someone cry or kiss or laugh or fall over in the streets, our brains react as if we were crying or kissing or laughing or stumbling ourselves. Now, obviously I wrote this when things like dancing and kissing and crying in company were actually possible, but my point remains. Um, but mirror neurons are, are also active when we read which means that there's very little difference in the operation of our brains between reading about walking through an airport, again, remember doing that, um, for example, or, and physically walking through an airport ourselves. And so Leslie Jamison, who's one of my favorite essayists, calls this the magnetic signature of empathy. And I think it's an incredibly exciting idea for us as writers, because it shows that the work that we do affects the brains of our readers on a physical level and that the stories we tell become a part of their experiences, basically indistinguishable from those they've act actively, actually lived themselves. And what I think this means for those of us who write from our own lives is that our personal experiences, our lives can work for others as the specific and concrete evidence of how the abstractions of science, politics, or economics actually play out. Jamison refers to this as the particular mess, sorry, the perpetual mess of particularity 
the small and incredibly complex moments that are sculpted by or contingent on much larger forces. Personal experiences are the particulars that illustrate whichever big concepts we might talk about or write about, that explore their minute implications and that make them meaningful. This is important because we cannot care, at least in the same way, about abstraction. And it means that writing about our experiences is always a political act of providing and propagating qualitative data, of representation, of empathy, and of imagination. So in the year after I published Small Acts of Disappearance, I went to a lot of festivals. <laughs> Remember when we did those? Um, and it was a strange and very new experience for me because until that point, I'd only really worked in poetry and hadn't quite realized that prose is an entirely different ball game in terms of audience and reach and interest. I, I had genuinely expected that Small Acts would be received in the same way as a poetry book, especially because it's such a strange prose book. Essay collections were still something of an emerging form of this country, although this has changed a fair bit since then. They're still definitely not mainstream. And the book's non-linear, it's super literary, and it talks around rather than directly about its subject matter. So I sort of expected that a few people would read it, there'd be a few reviews, and then everything would resume as normal. And I genuinely did not expect the book to find the audience that it did. But what this meant was that I suddenly found myself speaking about the book in public and to all kinds of publics, not just the literary nerds that I was used to addressing at poetry events. And at the Sydney Writers Festival that year, which was the first festival that I attended, um, I was really startled, especially in my first session, by how many members of the audience wanted to use the question time at the end of the discussion to talk about their own experiences, past, present, or vicarious with eating disorders. This has happened a lot since, of course, and I now think I'm much better at handling it, though at the very beginning it used to blindside me. And I still think it can be a pretty confronting thing. I can't help but feel that magnetic pulse of empathy. And so before each of my other panels, uh, while we're hanging around backstage and having those tiny microphones clipped to our collars, um, I decided that it would be a good idea to mention that this might happen to the other writers I was speaking with as a trigger warning, as it were. It's probably something else my friend would add to his list of things we need to stop saying. But it turned out that I needn't have worried because I hadn't realized this, almost all of the other writers had similar, if less extreme, stories to share. One novelist, whose book was about a mother who leaves her young family, said that she's often waylaid by stories from women who abandoned, her word, their own children, or mothers who felt anger and despair at the demands their infants make upon their lives. Another, whose book was about the death of her brother, listens to outpourings of grief. And a third, who writes erotica, mentioned that very strange people tell him very strange things about their sex lives, which made me think that I was getting off easily after all. I became fascinated by this impulse to share, not because it seemed to be a kind of confession, which is what one of the other writers suggested, but because I think it speaks of recognition or a mirroring, as it were. I think all writing does this. It offers us glimpses of recognition, of shared experience or emotion. At best, we might find an articulation of some belief or feeling that we, as readers, have held within ourselves, but not quite known how to describe or name. I'm tempted to go so far as to say that these glimpses, these moments, are the reason why we read, and maybe even the reason why we write. But I think the personal voice offers glimpses of recognition that sometimes burn into our retinas because it's intimate by its very nature because we get a sense that we're being taken into confidence and trusted with the very human vulnerability of the writer. And the personal voice in nonfiction, I think, does this even more so, because the truths, emotional or otherwise, that it conveys are grounded in the material rather than the imagined world. This really happened to me, the voice says. This is how it hurts. And most importantly, this is why I can't stop thinking about it. I think the subject, the very subjectivity of the personal voice is important because it offers a kind of truth and a special kind of truth because it knows it is inevitably embroiled in the world and its contradictions and inequalities in other stories and other people in long histories and cultural traditions and assumptions. Objectivity, that thing that nonfiction writers and journalists are traditionally supposed to aspire to. We know that that can only ever be a myth, but pretending that it isn't as so much news reporting and traditional nonfiction demands not only misses some of these opportunities for recognition and mirroring, 
but also flattens out the truth by flattening out the very real differences between people and their contexts. I think objectivity also speaks with a voice that normalizes one particular experience and ignores anyone who disagrees or is different, unusual, other. For me, objectivity has never been an option because the experiences I write about, living with a body that's aberrant and a brain that's unwell, hospital admissions, long-term renting, uncomfortable travel, all of these are things that I never saw represented and never in a way that I recognized or that sent me glimpses of myself. In a way, I think this is almost incredible considering that mental illness affects almost half of our population across its lifetime, and that those rates are even higher in creative industries and higher again for writers. And I once read higher again for poets, so <laughs> lucky us. <laughs> or considering that half of Australians live with long-term illness or something like 83% of people in my generation are living in mental stress. I remember thinking, for example, before my first hospitalisation that I was about to experience either girl interrupted or one flew over cuckoo's nest and neither prospect was particularly appealing. But what this meant for me, ew, too fast. <laughs> what this meant for me was that I thought my experiences weren't normal and weren't important, even that they were shameful because they were so decided the other. What this meant was that I spent a lot of my life second guessing my life because it doesn't look the way that our cultural narratives have said that it should. What this meant was that I kept fighting my illness for years after it should have been apparent that fighting wasn't the right metaphor because it was the only metaphor, one that's designed and used most often by the healthy, I might add, that I had. And I also think that our existing mental illness narratives, which I've always been determined to write against, as much as they oversimplify the processes both of falling ill end of getting better, and they're almost always about getting better, work by setting up the unwell person as, some, as that something other, something abnormal, something wrong, the behaviours that are the symptom of the illness and are often painfully embarrassing and shameful are displayed but rarely explained. The hospitals and groups and other therapies take place in enclosures of a kind, away from any contact with the wider world. The wider world, that is, isn't implicated in the illness neither in its etiology or in the way the illness is experienced, or even the way that the unwell person is treated. The kingdom of the unwell, as Susan Sontag calls it, is an island nation. And then the return to health is betrayed as a return to normal functioning society, to work, to family, to friends. It's a triumph and a victory, and illness is an interruption. Then normal life resumes and carries on. There's no room for ambiguity, for learning to live differently, for illnesses that are life-changing rather than the recovery that's life-affirming. But mental illness, I've realized, is often, although not always, um, an extreme manifestation of perfectly ordinary human attributes, nervousness, sadness, loneliness, our striving for something bigger, more meaningful than our ordinary selves and lives. And so interrogating it, as personal as this process is, means asking big questions even if they're writ small. Jamison calls this process a collaborative inquiry with the author and reader facing the same questions from inside their inevitably messy lives. But there's a messiness to essays that I like and that I find lifelike. They ask and they explore and they remain an open form. They're about process rather than progress and they're unfixed and contingent and qualitative as our very selves. So this mutability um, or even transience that's so important to the essay form is the reason that they became the form with which I was most comfortable and which I still find most exciting. It was almost accidental that I came to essays. The first pieces that I wrote, which became the first two essays in small acts, were written in response to two very specific briefs, right at the time when I was first having to reconsider my illness and the stories I'd been telling myself about it for the entirety of my adult life. At the time, I didn't know how to write about my illness. I didn't think I could write about it because it too resisted narrative. I couldn't pinpoint when it began. I was and I still am very much in the middle of it. I didn't know how it would end. And I still believed then that it definitively would end, but that's a different story altogether. And more importantly, the process of getting better really was and maybe still is one of continually changing the mind. I mean that in both senses in the everyday sense of I was going to wear a blue shirt and then I changed my mind. And also in the sense of changing, reshaping, reconsidering the mind and the way that it works. 
my illness, my history, my sense of self kept changing as I moved through different treatment centres, travelled to different places, grew older, read and reread. And I needed a form that could contain these changes and contradictions and not iron them out or force them to resolve. What this has meant, I realised much later, is that what narrative arc there is, both in small acts of disappearance and the world was whole, is really one of developing thinking, of watching ideas solidify and change, contradictory as those two forces seem to be. It's the thinking that's the main progression in the books, that is, the thinking that they're mapping. And maps are most useful when they're detailed, when they're small and when the small variations are plotted out and not alighted. That said, it still terrifies me at times that the thinking is what's so important in an essay because it means that you really have to work hard. You have to be rigorous. You have to really interrogate your own mind, look for its blind points and its sticking points, poke around in the corners that you normally and preferably would leave untouched. And you need to be honest because your reader can tell when you're hiding something. One of my favourite writers on this matter is David Shields, who has a wild and exhilarating book called Reality Hunger, which is an extended complex an extended contemplation of the potential of the personal and the factual in all kinds of writing. Uh, and Shield states that ambitious memoir isn't fundamentally a chronicle. Rather, memoir is the story of consciousness contending with experience. And this makes perfect sense to me. When the mind keeps changing, the only way to write about it is to explore how it contends with experience, how it responds to certain stimuli and stories, the knots that it works at but can't quite untie the attempts that it makes to assay a world that can never be measured by numbers alone. Shields pays particular attention to the illness memoir in his book. Largely, he admits, because he too inhabits the kingdom of the unwell. And for all of his interest in form, in hybridity, in the roominess of non-fiction, which he compares to an entire drawer labelled non-socks in what I think is my favourite line in the entire book. Um, his examination of cichlid, as I still like to call it, boils down to one small paragraph where he says, the best illness memoirs, especially those dealing with psychiatric illnesses, are written, I believe, not for the purpose of peacock display, but to offer solace. I write with the full faith that the reader I envision is hungry for my talk, because I know how hungry I am for reports from the trenches, stories that might help me map my way. Now, of course, I both love and loathe that Shield's main metaphor here is one of hunger, um, I've lost count of how many people, doctors and laypersons of like, have asked me questions like, what are you really hungry for? But I also think that the solace that Shields is talking about here is the same kind of thing that Jamison calls empathy, an entering into another person's trench, a travelling together, and that his hunger is for the glimpses of recognition that might provide this, those small details, those pieces of qualitative data that illuminate the world. Shields goes on to describe the illness memoir as a kindly, a, keep, a kindly attempt to keep company that might help readers feel a little less lonely and freakish, less aberrant and less other in their subjective experience of the world and in all the things that can't otherwise be easily accounted for. So that's my manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit ranty, but uh, I was feeling spicy. <laughs> it's uh, interesting. Mm. Anyone have any comments or questions or like the floor? Yeah, for my poor old husband. Well, he uh, he's supposed to be writing a thing about his depression for the Reader's Digest now. <laughs> it was just about to start. I'm just oh. talking about the um, and you were talking about that, you know, heroic, the well, you know, the narrative, the triumph thing and that's what Reader's Digest is going to want so yeah <laughs> there's no getting around it and you know that's that's a real pressure um I think I was very lucky that I, I, and I am very lucky to have Jeremondo as my publisher um and you know I had an existing relationship with them um as my poetry publisher because there just aren't many poetry publishers mm. in the country but I also think um and I knew this at the time, that I don't think any other publisher would have touched that book in, in the form that it was in. I think, um, you know, because Giramondo is very interested in hybrid books and strange books and essay collections, they've done those before. And I think a, a kind of, I think any other tradition, any other publisher, a more traditional publisher, would really have wanted me to iron it out into kind of something with more of a, 
strong, firm narrative arc and probably a fucking hopeful ending too. Um, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's interesting that you've, um, you've, you've coined the term sick lit because yeah. certainly from within the, the YA sphere, which is where I'd, I've done most of my work, <laughs> sick lit usually means something quite different. It usually means something like The Fault in Our Stars or Zach and Me or something where, yeah. Yeah. where it's usually a young person wrestling with ideas of mortality before their time, if you like. And mm. so the sickness in the in YA sick list tends to sick lit tends to be tends to be fatal. Fatal. <laughs> and it tends to be the um, the catalyst by which the change occurs. You know, the, the either the mm. either the romantic relationship or the you know, one of my favourite sick lit books is um, called Before I Die by Jenny Downham, and it starts with this amazing line where it says, "Before I die, I want to feel the weight of a boy on me," and then it goes. I don't know if anyone's read it here, but no. as it gets towards the end of the book, because it's written in the first person by somebody who is dying, as it gets towards the end, um, and, you know, our advice to young writers is always, well, you can't write about dying because who's going to write it? Well, yep. she does. And as she gets towards the end of it, you end up with all this white space on the page and these repeated lines and this, and you fall into her mind. And it's, I, I very rarely cry when i read books but this this thing i was an absolute freaking mess but that's that's a slightly different thing from what you're describing as sit lit isn't it yeah yeah i think i'm i'm thinking i mean i use the term completely facetiously because i love like <laughs> there was a time when i was collecting um those those kinds of um stock phrases though so i had you know obviously it comes from chick lit sick lit um chocolate was one of my favourites. That's like chiclet that's set on a farm and apparently is a whole genre. Um, chocolate, did you say? Chocolate, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anita Heiss says that she writes chocolate um, because <laughs> chocolate for brown people. Um, <laughs> um, oh, gosh, there are some, there are some crackers out there. Um, oh, you know, and cli-fi for climate fiction. Um, you know, I just, I just love all of these, all of these little terms. <laughs> You know, it's it's sort of. I think I I think I started using it defensively, really, because I was really worried that people were going to be dismissive of the book to be like, oh, you know, no one wants to read about that. Um, so it was it was really kind of I started doing it as a kind of make the joke before they can, um, which is a terrible habit of mine. <laughs> I, I I like the I like what you said about um, when you talk you talked about. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought all of a sudden. Um, it'll come back. No, that's right. You're talking about how, how a lot of the time this kind of writing is focused on getting better mm. and the, the, the challenge and the, or, or the battle. You know, they're yeah. fighting for survival, that sort of thing. And Stephen Fry talks about his, his battle with depression or bipolar, I believe. And, and he has said several times that he fully anticipates that one day it will all be too much for him and that'll be the end. And he yeah. sort of has kind of just accepted that that is so much a part of who he is that he, if he, if he tries to counter that by through medication or whatever, that's going to make him less of who he is and therefore he won't be who he has always wanted to be. And as a result, but he accepts that the payoff to that is that one day he's probably going to do something drastic. So, yeah. Look, I don't advocate not taking your meds. Um, <laughs> Well, that, 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 no, exactly. But that, that's, that's his position, really. Yeah. And, you know, I, one, of the, one of the other things I, find, I found really kind of tricky and, and really have resisted as well is um, the kind of narrative that ties up your genius with your madness, for want of a better formulation, because I think that's a really dangerous thing too. Um, you know, and there's a, there's a little bit of this in, in small acts where I kind of thought very deeply about the idea that, you know, my writing and my illness come from the same place, that they're both kind of about, um, you know, measuring, controlling the world, um, you know, putting shape and order to it. Um, but that doesn't mean that one's dependent on the other. Um, and, you know, I don't... I feel really uncomfortable with that narrative because... Yeah, I think that's a load of crap. Yeah, because I would still write, <laughs> I would write something different. And, 
you know, probably more fun for starters. Um, well, once, once upon a time there, back in the, back in the early part of the 20th century, I think, there was this whole thing about alcohol and creativity, you know, and, yeah. and, and how it was supposed to, like there was this whole sort of thing about, you know, yes, really drunk is part of being a writer and all that sort of stuff, which is, of course, absolute crap because the least kind of work you can do. I mean, you know, when you're an alcoholic. Anyway, so I thought that, you know, I think they go through these kind of, yeah, 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 it's, I think because they're both sort of mysterious forces, so people like to kind of clump them together. Um, well, when, when my wife dragged me off to the doctor, because like mm. most writers, I, you know, suffer from depression and treated for it and all the rest of it. But um, when my wife dragged me off to the doctor, she had enough and dragged me off to the, see my GP and said, tell her what you've been telling me. And so I, mm, do I have to? And so I did. And, and um and I said, but my big concern is that if you put me on something that fixes this or helps this or aids this or makes this an easier path or whatever, you know, I'm aware that my writing comes from, comes from a place of melancholy a lot of the time. Mm -mm. Is that going to take that side of my creativity away? And her response was, well, it might, but you won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other yeah. one, had <laughs> okay, okay. I had a doctor once say to me something like, well, you know, so would being dead. Um, <laughs> it's a fair point, isn't it? There's a fair rejoinder. Um, <laughs> what, what do you what do you make then when you when you talked about nonfiction and 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 the the part that this kind of nonfiction, this memoirist kind of nonfiction essay mm. style fills? What do you make? And I, I can't remember, but I think maybe you and I spoke about this on the podcast. Maybe we didn't. I don't know, but. The James Frey situation, where he writes uh, a book that is, by as far as everyone is concerned, because he told them it was the case, yeah. was memoir, and then when it was revealed that it was actually all made up, suddenly everyone went, "It's the worst book ever written." Five minutes ago, it was the best book, best memoir ever anyone's ever written. And suddenly, it's to be swept aside. I mean, is the fact that it's non-fiction does that give? credence to the opinions you carry when you're writing it? Oh, look, I think in that case, I, like, I might like, just call your book what it is and, and we're fine. Because um, <laughs> it would have been a great, no it was a great novel, but yeah. suddenly everyone's well, like, no, we're not going to buy that anymore. Well, I think what it ties into, and I think this happens a lot in the States, I think it's sort of a less, um, a little bit less so here, but it's still one of those kind of narratives that circle around this thing, is, is this idea that what makes a memoir good is um, exposing your pain and suffering. Um, and so what might seem melodramatic in a novel is somehow worthy in, in nonfiction. Um, and I don't, you know, I just, it's kind of, it's a bit puerile and, and kind of voyeuristic and, um, you know, it's all the reasons that I didn't write a regular memoir. Um, cause I had those ideas too. I was very snobbish about the idea of memoir. Um, and I, and, and insisted the whole time actually that I wasn't writing a memoir. I was writing a book of essays and I still call them both books of essays. Um, but when, you know, um, when we got to the kind of the last bit of small acts, the kind of stuff where you're actually making it into a book and putting together all the material that goes with it. Um, my publisher sent me the kind of the publicity sheet that goes out and it said, it said memoir in the, in the category. And I sort of emailed back and said, it's, it's not a memoir. It's a book of essays. And um, he just kind of, I oh, know we must've done this face to face because I remember the withering look that he gave me um, and said, there's no essay section in a bookshop. Right. Where would they put it? Well, that's very telling, isn't it? Because that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the argument with, you know, YA and all these things is it's, yeah. it's really about air, sections in a bookshop rather than who's reading it and what they yeah, and it's, take from it. And it's fair, you know, it's, it, it's fair in a way. And, and I mean, at the time I didn't, I didn't really know much about memoir because it wasn't a genre that I'd read a lot of or had any particular interest in. Um, 
and kind of in the in the year after Small Axe, I did a lot of research into essays and memoir to try to figure out what the hell I'd done, um, so I could talk about it. And and part of that was realizing that so many of my preconceptions were just stupid, um, and and not the case at all, and that there are all kinds of ways to write memoirs and what I'd done really was a memoir and it was a collection of essays. You can be both things um, and it doesn't really matter. You know, the, the kind of all of those labels are really, um, it, I don't want to say unimportant because I think they sometimes let well, you do. Well, they're important to someone, aren't they? Like, yeah, people. yeah, but they're, they're not firm categories. You know, they're slippery um, and whatever's useful is useful and whatever isn't, you should just leave aside. So anyway, when you're talking about the eating disorder beds and being four of them, I interviewed yeah. Pete Schmigel um, a few weeks back who wrote that piece in the Sydney Morning Herald about his mother dying of COVID in New York. And he used to be yeah. the, he used to be the, um, the CEO of, uh, not Beyond Blue, the other one, uh, Lifeline. He used to be the CEO uh -huh. of Lifeline. And he, he told me that there are four, I think we talked about this, this last month, actually, there, were, there are four full-time psychiatrists, psychiatrist positions west of the Blue Mountains in New South Wales. Mm. Four. Yeah. And he was talking about suicidality and it often comes down to a 15 minute window where all the normal, all the normal way that, ways that you would think are suddenly step, put to one side and you go into this aberrant way of thinking for this very short window. And he said, and that's the window that you need help in. But if you've got to wait 40 days, two months for an appointment at Bathurst Base Hospital, how to, how do we, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's not a question. It's just a kind of a statement, really. It's a little bit alarming, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a tricky thing. And, you know, um, it, it's sort of the thing that, you know, there's sort of two things that I found really kind of challenging about that at the time, which was, um, you know, firstly, that the only way you learn how to navigate the system is by navigating the system. So, <clears throat> so when you start out, you just got no idea what you're doing and you kind of learn on the fly and and that's terrible like there's no one to kind of show you how it works you just got to kind of bumble your way through and make mistakes and get there eventually but the kind of but the fact and also the fact that the public system is so terribly understaffed that you have no choice but to use the private system um and so this idea that you you choose whether you go into the private system or not is complete bullshit um you know, because like I said, I was on a waiting list that was 48 weeks long. People die. A, a lot can happen in 48 weeks, can't it? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if all this telehealth's going to make things a bit better. Because, you know, you're doing um, telehealth with psychologists mm. and psychiatrists. And that means that you could get, if you're living way out, you could get better psychiatrists from Sydney on telehealth. I'm just wondering if that would work. If I, I can I can speak to that very briefly um, because I worked in emergency department up at Katoomba and I, I need to be conscious of the political um, mm. implications of what I'm about to say. But um, this is exactly why we needed a better a better NBN. Um, they've got a machine up at Katoomba Hospital in the emergency department that I can't remember what it's called. It's got an acronym, but it, it's, they've got tape on the floor and it parks at the end of one of the recess beds and it's got a camera, it's, there's a camera over the bed, it's got a couple of cameras, it's got a light viewer with a camera over it so that they can put x-rays on there. It, it links into the the, um, the monitoring and the ECG and all that stuff. And that goes straight to a, a hot desk down in Nepean emergency. Oh, okay. And so there's all these, right. all these remote hospitals like Mudgee and, oh, there's not really Mudgee anymore, but you know, um, Katoomba and wherever. Uh, and they all link into one of these major centres like this, but they can get glitchy. And this is exact. you know, when, when, Tony, when Tony Abbott said that we don't need a better NBN because, you know, we're not all just going to be watching YouTube videos. No, nobody ever suggested it was about YouTube videos. It was actually about health and education was where really where the, the big benefit was. But anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> you, looked at, you were about to say something about that, Fiona, I think, weren't you? Oh, I think there's a zoning issue too. I think um, I think hospitals work the same way that schools work, that you've got to live in the zone to get access to whatever your zone has. If you're in, if you're in the public system. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Mm. Hey, Fiona, I had a question, which was, um, 
when you talk about, I really loved what you said about writing for um, for solace for people mm. to read and recognize and, and find comfort. And it seemed to me a really gentle thing that you were saying to write from, from that place. But sometimes do you feel like writing from an angry place where you might provoke people into awareness? Yeah. And, and you know, I think um, uh, I'm going to say it's the older I get, the angrier I get. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that's real. Is it real? I'm, to- real. <laughs> I'm so rude now. I can't be asked. Middle-aged women have been putting up with so much shit for so long yeah, that the capacity just good. crack and then you just get really rude. And it's not I've never back, been yeah. rude like this before. I used to be so, and like I wouldn't dare. And then I just sort of thought, fuck it. So yes, totally. Excellent. <laughs> that makes me very happy. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I do think, I think that, um, I think that the book that I'm working on now is angrier. Um, and I mean, I, I feel like it's got two threads too, that there's a kind of um, part of that is the same impulse to kind of be like, these are my experiences and I know that they speak to other people's experiences, but it's taken me a very long time to be like, and actually it is fucked up that this happened. And, yeah. the, and um, it, it, it's sort of very much a book about um, the cultures or, or the way that medicine and culture kind of interact with each other and kind of all of the, the fact that medicine isn't this kind of, um, pure empirical thing that we're kind of taught to assume that it is and all of the crap that kind of feeds into it and sort of you know and a lot of that is sexism let's face it um <laughs> um and kind of you know been doing a lot of a lot of research into uh women's experiences in in medicine and the kind of stuff that or these kind of historic assumptions about women's bodies that get carried over into the present day that we don't really unpick because until we're kind of in the middle of them and I kind of blindly accepted a lot of them too because I was just desperate for help um sorry Fiona you're sounding a bit hysterical yeah exactly (laughs) yeah right yeah you know what it makes me think of because Lionel Shriver I reckon lately has been a very angry writer she can really tell she's so pissed off um, Mm. coming out everywhere with her yeah so I hope much all that was the can you know the healthcare one. She really sort of did you read that? No, I didn't. I should. Oh right, it's a good one. It's all about this woman with cancer, and I mean, you know, it's just you know dissecting the American health system. Mm-hmm. One that I literally just read last week is called The Mandibles. Have anybody read that one? Is that okay. Lionel Shriver? Hmm. Lionel Shriver. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I couldn't you know. believe it. That was recommended to me. And I'm like, oh my God, because it's the collapse of, you know, the American, it's collapse of America. So it's so prescient. <laughs> and I was literally reading this and I've got to read you this because this is unbelievable. Okay. The whole of the country is falling apart, right? Then, wait for it. Then this was published several years ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think I remember. Then there was the emotionally charged issue of toilet paper. <laughs> In most major cities, stockpiling of family packs was rife leading to chronic shortages and gouging. At the shelter, it had become impossible to keep the restroom supplied because residents swiped the rolls. The Department of Homeless Services had issued a memorandum withdrawing funding for paper goods altogether. Public facilities and the likes of department stores and museums also ceased to provide the means of tidying up after one's ablutions, presumably having suffered the same pilfering from a higher class of clientele. Florence initially taped a two squares per white notice above both holders, a polite request that given the continued depletion of his precious resource downstairs was roundly ignored. She tried discreetly taking her sister aside and saying maybe she peed too often. (laughs) If she was capable of disciplining her digestive tract during dry outs, perhaps she could direct a degree of similar grit to her planet. I couldn't believe it. Fucking, she could tell that toilet paper was going to be, anyway. I've been doing a lot of, um, because I'm a giant nerd, um, reading books about pandemics right. uh, like I, I read I mean I read some non-fiction books which just blew my mind and, and are so exciting and I'm definitely going to end up writing something on the back of those but um pandemic fiction all and it's it's sort of it's sort of super interesting that they seem to fall into two classes um 
and one is like I've been reading books that were written in and after the Spanish flu pandemic um, that are really interested in like dealing with just the horror of this. Um, but then there's another class that is all kind of speculative fiction in a way from earlier um, where the pandemic is really becomes a way to talk about a different issue. So one, one was really about kind of refugees and migration. One was really about animals. Well, actually two of them were about animal rights in, in very different ways. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of super interesting to kind of think about these kind of abstract, like the use of a pandemic as an abstract narrative device. And to be reading that in a time when there's nothing abstract about this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're kind of, um, some of it's super prescient because these researchers, uh, because these writers did all this research into the sorts of language that, be, that we'd be using now. So, you know, all this stuff about masks and sanitation and um, droplets and fomites and social distancing and, you know, all of these words that were just like, oh, yeah, 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 like we know that now that they've gone to great lengths to research and then explain in ways that like seem natural in the dialogue between characters. And they're like, oh, you wouldn't even need to explain that now. Oh, no, that's right. It in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's remarkable. There was a point in March where you found, oh, I'm saying March, late March, April, all of April, Ooh. where you found that whatever you wanted to write about, just you questioned the relevance of it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I had, I'd had a, I had a huge moment with that, especially because um, I joke all the time about coming from a long line of people with really sensible jobs. So everyone in my family is um, a nurse, um, a teacher, or a cop. But we, you know, forget about them. Um, but you know, they're all they're all essential workers. And and I was like, and I'm gonna like what write a poem about it? Awesome. <laughs> Um, at least yeah. you get to stay at home. <laughs> yeah, like, you have to go out with and face the music. And look, I've I've been practicing staying at home by myself for years. So it's yes, like that's right, exactly. Most writers, it's like yeah, whatever. Like, <laughs> when you're speaking about, it really is the angry, um, the angry episode. I don't know if anyone listened to the podcast this morning, the, the main one that we do, but um, it's Alanis Morissette's birthday today. Oh. So jagged little pill, you know, one of the <laughs> one of the angriest little albums ever made, and I've just first CD I ever bought. It's one of my very early ones. Absolute monster. And I only CD. bought one it the... because it had swears in it, and I thought it would be naughty to play it really loudly in my bedroom. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, thirty three million copies that she sold of that that album. Um, mm -hmm. But I was interviewing Ali Whitelock. I don't know if any of you know Ali at all, poet. Mm -hmm. um, and I, can I can I play something that she put together because. She basically, she basically, I don't know if any of you have heard this, um, it's a found poem where she put the words, she discovered that she would listen to Scott Morrison talking about having to be in Hawaii because he promised his kids and all that. Yeah. And then she found all the tweets of people who <laughs> were tweeting about oh, the, the radio station saying, if you are in a certain area, you have left it too late to leave. You can't leave. Here's how oh, you yeah. protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And then people tweeting about it. And so she put them both together side by side in a found poem. Can I play it for you? Yeah. And then um, it ended up getting played on the Bolt. It ended up getting played on the Bolt report. Um, and one of her one of his guests said, um, uh, oh, I feel, I feel like she said, he said, how does that make you feel? And they said, like, I want to vomit. And someone else said, well, it's not Tennyson, is it? Um, <laughs> But it only ended up on the <laughs> it only ended up on the Bolt report because Malcolm Turnbull um, yeah shared it. So this this is her version on her version on YouTube. It's called "This Is Cold, Don't Be Afraid." It's, I think it's stunning. Have a look. If you are in or close to the bush, leave now. You choose to stay, we may not be able to save you. Save any woolen blankets you may have, wrap yourself in them when the fire comes. There is no, no better place to raise kids. If you are trapped in your car, Face towards the oncoming fire, tightly close windows and doors, get down below window level, this 
is your highest priority. The Prime Minister regrets any offence caused to anyone for him being away at this time of crisis. For those of you in fire affected, insert town name here, it is now too late to leave. The girls and Jen will stay on and stay out the rest of the time we had booked here. We will not be changing our climate policy settings. But I'm comforted by the fact that Australians would like me to be here just simply so I can be here alongside them as they're going through this terrible time. How good is Hawaii? If you don't have a bushfire smoke respirator, P2 or a flat fold mask, including valve 9322A plus maximum two packets per customer was 94.95, now 77.45, stay indoors. I don't hold a hose, mate, but I understand people are angry, people are hurting. This is cool. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Seek shelter from the heat of the fire. But look, the girls and Jen, they love holidaying in Hawaii. And so we've had a few nice days here. Drink water to prevent dehydration, evacuate your horse to the beach, have your children roll for their lives. Australians will be inspired by the great feats of our cricketers. This is not about climate change. We are meeting and beating our Paris Agreement targets. How good Australia! To the 500 million species we burned, how good the cricket. You won't be getting any votes down here, buddy. You're an idiot. Leave the pregnant woman's hand alone. The sky will turn black. Turn your headlights on. You're out, son. Do you have a bushfire survival plan? Activate it. I remember a lot of those lines. Yeah. yeah right. And, and, and the, <laughs> point that, the point that she makes is that just that, um, you know, it's funny that they were criticising her for it and she's going, I didn't write this poem. I was effectively a curator of this poem. Yeah. Um, you know, it just, it is what it is. And turning people's words on them. I did ask her whether she was tempted to make a found poem based on the comments of the people on the Bolt report. And she... <laughs> like I, I made one once. Um, out of lines from student essays about um, the bell jar. Um, it's completely unethical, so I can never publish it, but God, it was cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to go now, James and everybody, sorry. Um, but I will guess I will see you next time. Well, Thank thanks you so thanks much. for coming, Catherine, appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. I'll see you later. See you later. Bye. Thank you so much, Fiona, for um, for doing this. I should have mentioned at the beginning. Um, we tend to re we record this. It probably you can probably see in the corner it's recorded. Oh, <laughs> is that all right? <laughs> yes, fine. <laughs> so, I would have put um, makeup on. Oh no, you look fine. Um, yeah. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'm not sure who our guest is going to be in a month, but it will be someone good again. Um, and apologies to you, Fiona, for screwing up last time with you. That was my uh, mistake. Things and, happen. Yeah, I'm. We had, we had a great chat anyway. But um, <laughs> okay, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it, and uh, hope to see you again next time. Yeah. Thank you. See you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.